Uh, welcome to my Blueprint Marathon. It's only two hours long. It'll be fine. Two hours of hardcore blueprints. Um, good. So, my name is still the same. I'm still short. Um, I'm the evangelist for Europe. Been doing this now for, I think, four or five years and been using the Unreal Engine for 20 years. Started with Blueprint in particular in 2013, I think, before Unreal Engine 4 went public. Uh, I know that what I started with was uh, we had a, one single page of documentation on Blueprint when I started. That was, how do I make a door? So I started with a tutorial, how do I make a door? And I, that's it. And then I just start clicking around and experimenting with it and, and, and seeing where it takes me. That's usually how I learn things. I just click around, see what happens. It takes a much longer time than if I would just read something. But on the other hand, I also learn by doing that, I also learn what not to do. I learn to fail. I learn you know, all the things that a tutorial would not tell you necessarily how to do. Anyhow, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about Blueprint in depth. And I made a beautiful little graph here where it says dive into Blueprint and then learn stuff and then print string hooray. Good? That's kind of the conclusion. Um, but the idea is to give you an in-depth insight and knowledge of Blueprint beyond the usual topics. Uh, so this is not about you click here, right, and this is how you script it. It's a little bit about the bigger problems that you can face in Blueprint. Uh, it goes in terms of collaboration, how does the balance with C++, um, things like performance, what is costing performance, how do you then counter that, those kind of things. So that's really the focus of this talk. Uh, I am not a programmer. I am an artist designer. Um, and I'm going to get back to that a few times as well. So you need to look at this talk in that perspective. This is not me as programmer saying you should do this and this and this. This is me as designer saying I went terribly wrong here, here, and here, and here, and then a lot of programs got pissed at me here, and here, and here. So probably don't do that, okay? So that's how I'm going to uh, speak. But what we really want to do is we want to use Blueprint in an advice, scalable, performant, and future-proof way. Okay? It's not just about making it work, it's about doing this well. Uh, before I start, just for myself to have a little bit of an idea of who's in the audience, uh, who of you uses Blueprints daily or weekly often? Okay. And um, what's the average uh, degree of experience? Who has been using Blueprint for more than three years? Okay. okay. How many of you are programmers? Okay. That's scary. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you are artists? Okay. Designers? Or similar? Okay. It's about the same. Okay, good. So we'll see how this goes, okay? It's always scary when you do one of these talks to what does the audience already know? Maybe everything is totally obvious. I don't know. It probably isn't, I hope. I did this one at Unreal Academy in December for the first time. So, uh, Halfway in, there is a break. When I, there is a couple of slides halfway in that is the break point. I might not make it to that break point in time. So it might happen that I will just stop at a certain point. We take the break and we come back with the rest, okay? Because I just guessed where the break would be. I might have completely wrong, guessed it wrong. Okay. Good, let's get started. Before we start for real, there's two introductionary chapters. In fact, I had an overview slide somewhere that's going to come in a second. Uh, that shows you the general layout. But we start with an introduction, just refreshing your mind what kind of systems and features we have in Blueprints, just so everyone is aware these are our building blocks we're working with. And then I also want to formalize a little bit of the problem that we have that you might face with Blueprint. So we have those two out of the way. We're going to go in-depth technical in performance, compiling, etc. Good. I think getting started with Blueprint is easy, right? I mean, for me as well, I just clicked around, as I explained in the beginning. It's not that difficult to figure out. It's kind of like a flow chart, and it kind of just works in a way. Obviously, you've got to learn this, right? It took me a few months as well. But it's relatively straightforward. You can learn that. The real difficulty comes in doing this correctly. Um, even the way we design blueprints is kind of similar to, it makes programming concepts uh, easier to understand as well. So all of this is, it's, it's visual scripting. It designs to make it accessible. Um, so it's really about how to use it correctly. Um, and so we want to do this for three reasons. We want to have it future proof so you can extend it. Again, you'll see some of the mistakes I made with that. I'm sure you've all done the same stuff. Uh, collaboration is a, a topic that comes back often. How do we work in blueprints? They're, they're binary assets. I mean, how do we merge stuff together? What's the advice way forward? And performance is a typical one as well. Right? Because that's maybe not ideal. There's actually a website. I now forgot the name, but you can Google this. There's a website someone set up in a community where you can post Blueprint spaghetti pictures. It's a website that's dedicated to just that. So I took these pictures from there. So credit goes to whoever posted them there. 
for example, you could do that. I really like this long, long blue line. Like this is, you know, that line here, it goes up. You have no idea what's there, but it might be a lot worse. It's kind of like these, uh, these paintings where you see something on the edge of the screen like, and your imagination takes over with the rest. So it's really well done. Anyway, that's not that bad. It's just a lot of copy-pasting. At least it's clean. I like it. Every single part of it is commented. Anyway. That, I don't know. That, that's not that bad. It's just very compressed and I mean, it could be worse, but right? you can actually frame it. <laughs> I mean, I really like this one as well. This curl here is really nicely artistic. Yeah. Um, so Google that website and have some fun. Um, and just before we start, just make clear, BP means blueprint, obviously. Classes means either blueprint or C++ entities, right? Um, and native is equal to C++. So we're going to switch those terms around so everyone's aware. Lines mean break off subject. And so this is what we've got. Um, I hope to get here by the break, have performance covered, but again, the break might be somewhere halfway into performance. Okay, so we'll see how that goes. So we start off with these two introduction parts. Performance is a big one. This is technical. Compilation is technical. Okay, so runtime cost, ticking, profiling, memory loading, garbage collection, uh, with compilation overview and the impact of it, compile times, costing, recommended workflow, race conditions, although I only have a little bit on that. Uh, some on C++. That is a little bit, it could be longer there, but we're definitely going to cover that. Again, I'm not a programmer, so I'm going to cover C++ from a designer's perspective. Um, and then we have some miscellaneous tips. This is mostly here as backup in case I, I'm done early or you know, I, want, I need to manage my time. So it's just some random tips. OK. So let's start with just refreshing everyone's mind. You could kind of say this, and a lot of this is discussable, okay? There's a lot of different ways you can often approach the same problem. So you could say C++ is not a feature. You could reasonably say so, right? But for the sake of trying to give a schematic overview of what we're dealing with from a Blueprint perspective, in a way, C++ is a feature that helps the Blueprint workflow, okay? So let's just take that mindset for a second. You can discuss this for a few years if you want to, but just bear with me. Um, but you kind of have C++, all of this feeds into the system that's Blueprint. You've got data tables and curves. You've got data assets. You've got child actors, interfaces, libraries, framework, components, inheritance. Those are kind of the things you're working with, the building blocks. So I'm just going to step through those to quickly, again, refresh your mind. C++ could be smoothly combined with Blueprint. Um, you can smoothly bounce functionality back and forth between the two. It's obviously faster for performance, which we'll get back to later on. Um, in larger projects, obviously, better for collaboration. I think most of this is obvious to everyone, right? Um, inheritance meaning it inherits from a parent class. You can do this within Blueprint as well. I think, again, this is so fundamental to the engine. Everyone who's been using the engine for a while will understand this. Um, you got the framework classes, which means the standard classes, uh, such as game mode, player control, those kind of classes. Those are present within the Unreal Engine. It's a tool in your, in, in your toolkit as well to work with. Um, like that. We've got components. And when I say components, I specifically mean a Blueprint component, OK? I don't mean a light or anything else. Let's just focus purely on Blueprint right now. So you could have a component that holds some Blueprint functionality or C++ functionality that is added to the object and that to the actor. And that gives some specific, uh, well, specific results. So for example, in the, this is from my own game that I did a few years ago. We had a temperature system. So some items and some meshes had to offset the temperature. For example, the crystals were cold. So we made a component called temperature component, which ad added essentially an offset to the temperature. That you, can, you can set the range, and they did that. That's kind of what we use components for. And again, a lot of this is discussable. You could argue, yes, but we used a lot more, or you can have this kind of workflow, et cetera. Uh, but ideally, components in Unreal Engine tend to be used for specific solutions. They don't tend to be used, I'm going to have 50 different components, more like the, the Unity approach. That would be more their workflow. It's not typically what we do. Okay. You've got child actors. So it's literally another actor class that's been added as a child actor in another one. For example, this flashlight, the, uh, the, the volumetric light beam thingy itself, and the light actors, that's a child actor that got added to the flashlight. We'll get back to this later on as well with a few examples. It's not that commonly used, I think. Typically, again, specific purpose only. Uh, libraries meaning like a Blueprint library, or it could be done in C++ as well. Uh, so that's another one you can use. You've got interfaces, of course, within Blueprint. Um, you've got data tables and curves. So you can specify a curve and then read from that within Blueprint. You can make a data table, read from that in Blueprint. Okay. I think most of you, 
I hope, have done this before, all of this. Otherwise, the rest is probably going to get a little bit hard. Okay. Um, data assets exist as well. So you can make a data assets basically just holding a couple of properties and read from that. The entire system uses this by default. Okay. Now, um, interfaces are missing here, which is intentional. And again, this is comp you can argue with this for the next, the remainder of Unreal Fest, if this is correct or not. But it's one way of looking at it. I'm trying to just structure it a little bit, just to give you a little bit of a feeling what you're dealing with. And you could therefore argue, obviously, C++ inheritance is the absolute foundation. Framework would have a supporting role, libraries as well. You know, components, child actors tend to be more optional in, the, in light of what we just saw, etc. Right? But just trying to structure it a little bit. Anyhow, I think everyone understood that, so now we refreshed it. Let's talk a little bit about the main issue. Um, because once you're past the initial hurdle of learning how to work with Blueprint, you're going to hit very specific problems, especially if you're not a programmer. Okay? Uh, because you've never had to do that before. I hit those issues too. Um, you never, if you're a programmer, you're more, more, probably more likely to think of the bigger picture. And what is my architecture going to be like? Where does my certain functionality live? Uh, how would it then scale in the future? How do I make sure I can keep that as bug-free as possible? And how can I maintain it? You're going to start thinking of that. But if you're an artist or so, you've never done this before, you will not think that, probably. You will only start thinking that after you failed a couple of times or someone screamed at you in the office. Okay? So that's where. And I have this example, for example, of a, of a door. You will get in the next slide. But it's for example, this. At some point, I got this sent to me. They built all of that. I did this. Okay? And it's a super simple example. But you've, seen, you, you've been in these situations before. How do you make it easy to understand? How do you make it clean but still powerful? How do you get that balance right? right? I had a number of steps here, right? Did I do everything as clean and, and as few steps as possible? That's kind of the questions you should ask yourself if you look at this. If someone else would take over your work, would they understand it reasonably fast? Uh, do I have a logical distribution? Does it simply make sense what you've done? Or is it just bizarre, right? Did I take costing and memory and performance considerations into account that we're going to discuss later? And if ever you want to grow this, is that doable in a reasonable way? Those kind of questions you should ask when you build a system. And again, I, especially, I know that from a designer background, I never asked those questions until it went wrong. So I had this uh, Swedish door. I live in Sweden. Swedish door. Classical Swedish yellow door. So, and this is a very theoretical example. Um, so just bear with me. But it illustrates the point, right? So you're going to say, I want to make a door. Cool. To make a blueprint underscore regular door. You have a door. Okay. Easy, right? So there's a trigger. You walk into the trigger. The door opens. We made a door. Start placing it in the level. Then someone comes to the conclusion, actually, there should be a double door too. Okay? So we duplicate the first blueprint. Now we have two blueprints. They're exactly the same. They're duplicate. But in the second one, we make two door halves, but it's still the same trigger. It's only two doors, right? What could possibly go wrong? Right? So it's stuck fine. Then the problem is someone wants a revolving door and a garage door and an elevator door. So we start duplicating it again. Now we have five duplicate blueprints with some changes to it. It's maybe not ideal, perhaps. So someone comes to the conclusion, let's make a parent class in Blueprint called environment object or whatever we're going to call it, doors, anything you want, which has the main trigger functionality. And then there's child classes under it, which would be the actual doors, the variations on that. And then maybe the door has to be destructible, so we have a component in there just to handle that, perhaps. Right? Problem is, as the game goes along, because you know, this is what you do in your first prototype, this is a few months in, and it gets worse, right? Because then someone, for reasons we'll get back to later on, that probably should be some C++ classes above it. So now we have more locations where functionality could reside that have to do with opening the door. Then, well, perhaps you don't want just want to walk into the trigger. Perhaps you want to like, get close and then play an animation or press a button or something more than just walking in the trigger, right? So you've got the whole player and player controller things come, comes in and has functionality for the door too. Um, you want to have an animation blueprint is related to it because you need to play some animation for opening the door or whatever, right? There's more stuff. Um, you need a hut because you need to display something about, yes, you can open this door or not. So we have that coming in. Um, it gets worse because someone wants to have achievements, how many doors you want to open and stuff, so that has to keep track of it too. Then there's a lot of different levels with a lot of different uh, doors. So all the level blueprints might have references or some functionality related to opening doors. For example, if you open this door, a monster should spawn there or something. So somehow you need to link that together. Um, then there is AI. So then you need all of those classes. And then there's probably NPC, humanoid, enemy, and then there's a soldier or something. 
etc. Right? And again, it's a very theoretical example, but it kind of paints the picture of what happens over the course of game development. It gets worse because someone has weapons, you need to be able to shoot the door as well. Um, so eventually, you've got all of this that could potentially hold functionality related to you opening a door. So if you started this idea with, I'm going to do this, probably you hit an issue. And that's exactly what an artist and a designer is going to do, typically. I would have done that too. I would have done that. Yeah. And that's the goal of this, this, uh, this talk. So you want to keep things as simple as possible by having enough complexity. If you can manage that, you're good. There's a very golden line somewhere between, you know, keep everything as simple as possible, otherwise it's too difficult to maintain and understand, but don't skip out on using advanced features. But don't use advanced features for the sake of using them. This is a very fine line between them. So don't overcomplicate when you don't have to, but do use advanced features when it simplifies things. Uh, the functionality has to, be, has to be scalable. Try to be as agnostic and as, as justifiable. Of course, sometimes it doesn't make sense. You just do it, uh, but it depends case to case. And performance stability, stability should be taken into account from day one. Um, you've got collaboration on Blueprints is also, you know, it's a challenge sometimes, and that's helped tremendously by designing it with the right architecture from day one. We got a merge tool, but it's not meant for day-to-day -day usage, right? So having the right hierarchy and distribution of functionality, it's gonna help you there too. Um, this is, for, again, it's theoretical examples, but this would be a theoretical example of what a car could be like and what the distribution of functionality could, could be like. Obviously, you've got an actor at the top, you've got a pawn, as you have, there's a wheeled vehicle, standard class, but then you would have maybe your vehicle class, your particular car class, and there's a blueprint class, comes directly from that. We're going to get back to why specifically I'm advising that, and then a, a blueprint sedan. Um, the headlights should probably be a child actor, perhaps because it's a set of different components together that's going to be used across different vehicles. Um, car engine values might be a data table, so you can easily tweak that stuff. Uh, there probably are some general libraries in use somewhere in there. Um, the components, the vehicle movement component is a standard component, but that would be a component. There's a data asset for the tires, that's also a standard part of the engine, but this kind of gives you the idea. Build up that architecture. Okay, good. All good? Let's start doing editor things. I'll switch to the editor back and forth as I'm doing this to demonstrate some of it. Again, a lot of the examples I've built in the editor are very strange by themselves. They're kind of just there to illustrate what I'm saying. Obviously, the best case scenario would be if I have a full game that we worked on for two or three years where you really see this, you know, in a realistic scenario. That's kind of difficult to simulate. So we'll have some theoretical ones in editor. Uh, in general, I think performance is really important even if for whatever reason you don't feel it's going to be an issue, um, working cleanly is good anyway. Okay? It's going to help with performance, it's going to help with other things too. Um, now, Blueprint is slower than C++. It's not slow, though. Uh, the most common reason that we see that people move from, uh, from Blueprint to C++ isn't speed. It's typically workflow and collaboration much more so than performance itself. There's, of course, exceptions to everything I'm saying, but in general. But nonetheless, there is a bit of an impact of Blueprints. Kind of, they are 10 times slower-ish, but it really depends a lot on what you're doing. Um, so it's difficult to put a number on it. Depends on the project, depends on the hardware. And as uh, Nick mentioned in the keynote yesterday, we are looking into and experimenting with different virtual machines for, for Blueprint. So we're expecting a further speed up of Blueprint performance in the future. Um, I got a graph that compares the different performances of blueprints in a couple of different states. I'm going to get to in a second. But before we go, there are a couple of reasons. Um, the first reason, not necessarily in the right order, but the first reason you could say why blueprint tends to be, could be slow, is simply executing large networks of nodes. Because the performance cost comes from the connection between nodes, not what the nodes actually do. There is a cost to them, but it's not necessarily blueprint related. So anything that is mod heavy or logic heavy, is for that reason expensive, because there's a lot of connections, right? So if you've got this example over here, um, it's very simple, right? Print string, or this does a line trace. This is 100% equal in performance in terms of blueprints. It's not 100% equal in performance across the board, right? Because this essentially triggers functionality in C++, both of them. But the act of triggering that via blueprint is a line, is a line, it's equal. And that's really important to note. 
Um, so related to that, anything that's related to quick loops tends to be relatively expensive. And also be, with quick loops, you have a lot of connections looping, simply. Right? So anything related to quick loops is on the expensive side. Uh, anything that requires iteration of large numbers of actors is on the expensive side. I have seen many examples of where someone does, on every time they press a button, they do get all actors of class or something. Please don't do that. Okay? It's like a cache the result or something. Um, so that's expensive too. Uh, and then, of course, ticking. And we're going to look into ticking extensively. Um, that's typically the, the most common cause of performance loss, exp extensive use of ticking. Now, for everyday usage, you're not likely to experience any slowdowns. I mean, I'm not telling you, please never do a while loop. Right? You have to judge this case by case. Uh, but eventually, if it's a long project, large team, etc., and you know, over time, it might add up. Now, Blueprints always execute a single threaded. It has a default of uh, a million, which translates to 250,000 in, in, in reality. Instruction execution limit per tick, and for all Blueprints combined. So you can set this in the project setting. You can actually set the maximum loop iteration count. I don't think you should change it. I'm just saying it's there. Um, you can't hit that limit unless you're really doing stuff in very suboptimal ways. Okay, so for that reason, you probably really shouldn't change it. And you probably really shouldn't hit the limit either. Okay. Um, if you hit the limit, you'll just get an error, says infinite loop detected or similar. A blueprint in itself doesn't give any significant overhead. Uh, so just making a prefab essentially with static mesh components in there, it doesn't give a measurable impact on performance. You would have to go very far for that to eventually start impacting you. Okay, so that, generally, that's OK. And also, we're going to look at the comparison now. Before we look at the comparison, note that I have, there's three different ways of doing this. You've got play in editor, you've got dev play, and dev play is my improvised name for meaning you start the game without, ship, without packaging it, right? So just do a dash game. Um, and shipping play is you package it and you play it. So let's take those three different states. We've got a very simple test blueprint, which again is theoretical. It's not necessarily always representative for real life, but it does a random calculation and loops that around very quickly. Okay, so on a timer every one second or whatever, it does like a lot of calculations looped, and again, a lot of calculation loops. So trying to strain the string blueprint. Okay, so that's what we had in this particular test. The slight difference between red and blue. Um, so it's C to blueprint. You can see it, it blueprint gets a little bit expensive. Blueprint is the red line, confusingly enough, I'm sorry. Um, it gets a little bit more expensive than the blue line here at the bottom. Yeah. But this is both in play and editor. Because the next one gets more interesting. This is, without C++, pure blueprint, shipping compared to play and editor compared to just running the game. And you can see play and editor is way more expensive. And you can see when you ship the project, when you package it, it's, even, it's half the cost of that one in the worst case scenario. And again, it's a theoretical test. It doesn't necessarily reflect on reality, but it gives an, it gives an idea of what you're looking at. Now, if you were to then compare this to C++ here, you can see this would have been blueprint, the blue line here. C++ would have been here at the bottom, uh, not suitable for the scale. But I mean, there is a difference. It is slower, but as mentioned before, it's not necessarily slow, it's just slower. And again, when you profile this, really pay attention to just how slow play and editor really is, performance-wise. Okay, so let's really look at ticking, because there is a lot to say about ticking. Um, so it's typically the number one reason for performance loss. Um, tick itself is not the only thing ticking. A timeline would be ticking while it runs. Uh, stuff like mouse X or one of those kind of things, those kind of inputs, they're ticking. Uh, in animation blueprints, the update animation is essentially ticking as long as that thing is active. Uh, in UMG, if you bind something, it's ticking. There's a couple more of them. Now, the obvious advice first, please don't do it much. That's the simplest advice, but it's the truth. Um, if you are going to use ticking, make it a deliberate decision. Don't just do it because it happened to have, it happened, right? You have to have thought this through. Uh, in 80 to 90% of the cases, you don't need to use ticking. You can also disable ticking on, on a blueprint by default, by the way. So in the uh, project settings, we had this in the tips yesterday as well, if you were there. And I forgot now what to type here. I think you can do, uh, can blueprints tick by default? You might, might want to disable that just to make it even more deliberate. So if you have people in your team and you know, they actually have to enable ticking for their blueprint, so it's like a conscious decision. Do I really need this? Yes, I'm going to say yes. 
Now, timers and events can take care of almost everything. So, simple example, you have a timer, it loops this print string, right? You can do a lot with that. You can offset the time with a random float and range if you have a lot of instances of this blueprint to distribute the cost. So instead of having, for example, in my game, I had 100 different items or so per level. All of those 100 items are on a timer, a couple of different timers. I don't want all those 100 items to loop at the same time because you've got a spike at the same time, right? So random float and range could help to distribute the load a little bit. If you do it event-based as much as possible, it's a simple UMG example. Instead of doing bind, so we did a bind on a, on a text field. So this is essentially ticking. Make sure the text in UMG only updates on an event, right? And you can do this across the blueprints. Event-based is always the best. Um, you can turn off ticking in a blueprint itself as well, or you can change the, sorry, the tick frequency, the interval. If a blueprint doesn't actually use ticking in its graph, Having this enabled or disabled doesn't make a difference. It's what I've been told, but some other people would contend that. So um, if you leave it enabled, it does show up in the ticking list, but it doesn't seem to bear a, a performance cost. I will show you later on how to display all the actors in the level that are ticking. This would pollute that list a little bit because it would just crowd the list with random stuff. So to be good, you might turn it off. Uh, you can have building conditions that limit how often when ticking is active. For example, you could do when player pawn get distance to. So you only do ticking if the player is closer than X number of units to the actor. It's an easy little setup. You could simply do that and it might be a benefit. Um, and similarly so, in the next one, you can reduce the tick frequency on distance as well. You could do distance to and gradually reduce the update rate of that actor, of that blueprint, the further away you get. Simple little setup, it's just those couple of nodes. You could obviously automate some of this in via C++ as well, via function in there. Uh, when you face away, you can actually, you have this thing called in Blueprint was recently rendered, that you can figure out if you're seeing an, an, an actor or not. So if you figure, if you know you can see it or not with that thing, if false, then uh, turn off the ticking or slow it down or whatever you want. So that's uh, another simple one. And again, it's really just a few nodes every single time. Um, often you can split the visual, the logic from the visual effects. This was my game from a few years ago, some of you might remember, uh, Solus. We had an ocean in there, it was a bunch of islands, so every island is obviously surrounded by an ocean. The ocean had rising tide. Um, the ocean was made by essentially a blueprint, and the blueprint was a giant mesh plane, which is the water surface and a couple of particles and other random things attached. And then there was uh, a box underneath, a collision box, which acts like a water volume and a post-process volume and such. And so the surface, the mesh itself, continuously looked at a float va value for the time or the tide or something. It read a value, and based on the value, it would change its position. So you lerp between A and B, and you would set that, set, 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 set. Um, that was really, 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 really slow, because it turned out that moving a gigantic trigger box across the entire level and doing an overlap check on everything in the level is not super fast. I don't know. Um, so my solution was often there is a very particular thing that's heavy. Ticking itself is not necessarily bad. My point is sometimes it's just one particular part of it. So take that one particular part out of it, right? I did the updating volumes. I put that on a timer. So that's the logic from the volumes. So I just set actor location. That's the timer now. But the visual functionality remained on tick because there was barely any cost to that. So again, judge it case to case and try to split it where possible. Um, and again, this same goes for uh, anything that's animated in general. It's a bit of a simple example, but I've got this, uh, this rotating mesh. Um, actually, it was a code on here, 06. All right, so I got that one. It rotates. And again, it's a simple one. You wouldn't probably have done this in Blueprint anyway, but the point is, if you want to animate a basic animation, if you can do this in the material, then it's done on the GPU not on the CPU, it's not on in Blueprint, and it almost always executes faster. This is faster than the equivalent of doing that in Blueprint, almost always. Okay. So whatever you can pull off doing via world position offset in the material, do that. Obviously, it's not gonna help with collision or other things, so there's limitations to this, but what you can, please do that. Because in fact, the next step is 07, which is what we have uh, over here. In fact, I can just show you in the editor. Got this little Blueprint here with a cube. If we play this, the cube goes from red to green. Cool. 
But if I change the option here, use parameter, and I'll show you in a second what that actually did, and I play this again, it also goes from red to green. It's the exact same thing. One of them is driven by blueprint, the other one is not. Um, you can see here is the blueprint, right? So this is your parameter switch. If it's true, it makes a dynamic material instance, and it has a timeline, so this is ticking, and it changes this with a timeline, right? Instead of doing that, you could have done that. It doesn't do this at all. It just makes the dynamic material instance, and then the material takes care of the rest without even being triggered by Blueprint. It simplifies your Blueprint, too. Because in the material that we have over here, let me see which one it is. Um, you can see if parameter this, it simply does that. There is a time, I divide the time, and it just runs. So it, it handles it. The moment it enters the world, the time starts being taken into account, and it automatically fades from that to that. That's it. You could use this for footsteps or something. For anything that has a set length of time, that simply will play its animation, its fate, or whatever it's meant to do, without you having to do this via blueprints. Again, that's almost faster, always faster than scripting that. Or again, very simple advice, just do it in C++, which is true. Um, but before you do that, please profile it first and really make, justify it, right? Why are you really doing it? Because often again, it, it's not necessary to move it to C++. Um, now, we've got a couple of different ways to profile and, and de debugging. There's actually a lot to say about this. This is a relatively short chapter, so I'll just step through a couple of these. Uh, I'll start with the obvious one. Um, but it's just to, I think the visual logger and, and those kind of features, which I will get back to in a second, I don't think they're maybe that well known or that much used. I never used them in production either. I've always kind of, I knew it was there, but it's just, I didn't see the use for it. But I think it's really cool, so I want to just highlight them. Uh, but first of all, as you've probably all figured out, you can visualize Blueprint as it runs, right? So if you're playing the game, you can see that happen. I'm sure you've done this before. So as you're playing, you could just do no debug object selected, third person character, and I can see this happen. I can watch values as well, which is the next slide. Uh, so if I right click something, I can, do, um, I can do it on this one, watch this value, it will print it above it and I can see it as it happens. This is really nice to debug your logic and kind of have an idea of where, you know, where the flow goes to. Right. Now, when you watch the values, there's actually, a, in the Blueprint debugger window, you can watch all of them at the same time, which is quite nice. So you can have a general output of everything you're doing there. You have a window, um, developer tools, Blueprint, debugger. In the watches, you would see all of the watches combined. So you have a general view of, of the whole thing. That's quite nice. And again, I knew it was there, but I, it's, it's, I never think of it while working. Well, it was actually a very useful tool. Uh, you got a visual logger. Actually, how many of you are using the visual logger at least once a year? Yeah, so that's about 8% or so of the audience. So that's what I mean. It's a, this is a nice tool. I like this one. And again, I always forget about it when I'm working. It's a nice tool nonetheless. So this is in performance eight. So the way it works is that you have to make a blueprint or within an existing blueprint. You have to enable visual logging. So on begin play, enable this log recording, yes. And then on tick, uh, you would have this setup that records it. So I'm doing a couple, there's a couple of random tests, but I take a health variable, it's just uh, a variable. You know, and I append it with text so I can understand in the visual log what it is. Health is X. I do a vislog text action. There's a vislog box shape, vislog location, and a vislog segment. Those are the different ones you've got. So you add those to it and essentially populate the properties. Right? So that's the text that's going to be logging. You can log a shape. This is the box shape. It's based on that location with this shape. Um, this is the uh, vislog location. It simply stores the location itself directly and will automatically give that a marker. Right, and I've got a couple of other things here. That's it. So you can add this in any blueprint you want, and then when you run the game, you can go to um, Visual Logger. So again, Developer Tools Visual Logger. In that window there, just play. And as you can see, it's recording that. So let me just jump a few times. Let me stop that and stop that. And so what happened now is you have the actor you were recording in here. This might be hard for you to read, but there it says health is 998. So you can see over time the health is now 587. Made the health tick gradually go to zero. So you can store the variables and see them over time. 
and you can see where the position was as this happened. Okay, so that's debug, that's my simple little test, but that was my player running through the world. So if, for example, you could enable this on all of your AI and see how your AI was navigating the world as they were trying to you know, locate the player or whatever they're trying to do. You can have a visual representation of all the, the variables you marked and the positions of things, which is quite nice to get an idea of what was happening. Yeah. Uh, you got the start window. Obviously, you just type start game. Um, this also tells you how many things are ticking. You've got a, a few things in here. Blueprint time is interesting. The tick time also shows you there's 19 things here ticking and the ticking cost, a couple of other things. Because in fact, with the ticking, what you can do is you have a command called dump ticks and that will give you an output of everything in the world that is ticking. That's very, very good to do. If you type that every now and then, you keep track of what in the world is actually ticking. So you can then go look into that and see, okay, is that justified or not? Did someone abuse this or not? So literally just type um, in the uh, in here at the dump ticks. Now in this very simple level, it's not going to do much, right? But it just outputs you. It's this one here. Uh, this is the ticking group it uses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you have that idea, and then you can go look at look them up. Good. And you have the regular profiler, of course which is quite precise in the sense that it can really show you, look, it's this particular blueprint, and we got these blueprint uh, functions or, or things in there, and they take this much performance per. Right. I think this one is, um, I use this one a lot in development. Uh, you can actually run automated tests, which again is a thing that's not necessarily well known. It's also rather strangely implemented, requiring a very specific naming convention, but if you do everything right, it will automatically appear. Okay. Uh, so you can do a functional test in code, of course, but you can actually have a blueprint functional test and have that be automatically recognized by the, the automated test window if you name it in a particular way. So I've done that. Um, I have made, hold on, it was 09. I have made this thing here. So I made, first of all, just a test object. Here's a test blueprint, it doesn't do anything, okay? It's meant to be a door. There's a trigger box, there's a door. It's very test. There's nothing in here, it just says, if the trigger box is overlapped, it says bool is through. That's it, it's just for a test. What we're trying to do an automated test on is, are my triggers of my doors, can they be activated by the player? It's a very basic test, but it illustrates it. Then you have a second blueprint, which is the functional test example. That is parent class, functional test. And by having it as functional test, you get two unique events. One is called event prepare test, and the other one is called event start test. Event prepare test is whatever it has to do before it does the test, obviously. So I'm spawning the door blueprint. I'm spawning that one at this location. And I remember which one it is. And then I spawn a character, just a regular character at this location, which happens to be inside the trigger box of that one. Okay? And then I run the test, event start test, and it's going to check, does the door, the bool of that door, is that true? If yes, then the door is being triggered, the trigger works, and we finish the test. And I can output a, 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 a string here that says test successful door activation, activation status is true. Otherwise, it will fail. Test result failed. And doing it like that, and then, very strangely, here's this very strange part, you have to make a level called ftest underscore, or it doesn't work, and you put the blueprint in that level, and you save that. Doing that will, sh if you then go to um, session front end, so developer tool session front end, in automation, we would then have project, and we see our functional test that we made. That is our blueprint. You can then enable that, and we can say, please start a test. That automatically runs that level, and it says the test was successful, and you can see here, too, the test is successful. So you can have a series of these blueprints, or one blueprint that does a lot of different things in the same step. It's a little bit of a weird setup, but again, I just wanted to highlight that, because I've not seen anyone do this. Let's actually stop that. Let's go back to the level we had, one second. Good. Um, trying to remember the time, half an hour, good. So, then we got memory and loading. And this is a really, really big one. Uh, there is a really fundamental thing in here that I realized way too late. I really wish someone told me this the day I started. Uh, and it took years. 
um, Blueprint is fundamentally different from C++ when it comes to loading in memory. Because Blueprint is content, C++ is, well, it's C++. Right? It's completely different. And you really have to understand that or things are going to go wrong. Um, when you have C++, all the C++ code will be loaded on boot. So you start the project, it loads all the classes in C++. Blueprint is only loaded when it's used. In fact, I have a slide here. It's crucial to understand. I think you get that from what I just said. Uh, there's a slide comment illustrating that. Let me go through this first. So C++ loaded on project boot, but content, which includes all the assets, including blueprints, is only loaded on an as-needed basis. So if you have C++ content, if C++ references content, the C, that content is loaded on boot as well. Right, so here's an example. Uh, you don't necessarily need to read it, but there's two, two, different, um, two different levels here. Both of those levels reference these blueprints. We're running the, uh, the reference check on the blueprint. So there's two levels referencing the blueprint. That means this blueprint will only be loaded if the level is loaded. That blueprint, in turn, references a mesh, which references a physical material, a material, and a bunch of textures. This is only loaded if this one is loaded, that one is loaded, that one is loaded, that one is loaded. That's content. It loads it as it needs it. Okay. I didn't know that, so I did that. Yeah. Um, that was only, this is the reference view, in fact, just to make sure everyone is on the same page here. If you have anything, you can right click reference viewer, and then you see what references it. This was a kind of bad example because nothing references my basic blueprint. Let's find something else. Um, let's take some random, in fact, let's take the performance test one because it's going to say it's going to be referenced by the level. Right, so you can see that references the door on that side, but on that side it's referenced by the level. You can change the search depth, which is not going to do anything here because nothing else uses it, but you can bump up the search depth and see the whole network of what is, okay, that one uses also a cube, and that will probably use a material. Okay, that uses a material, okay, we can, that uses a texture then I assume, yeah, see. So you can kind of see how the path is going to flow on. Um, now. This one isn't even the full view. I just couldn't really, I had to span it over my two monitors. One is above the other one. So I had a giant resolution. I zoomed out as much as possible. And I think I Photoshop because I think it's somewhere in here. If you see here, if the grid point here is messed up, that's a Photoshop copy paste of two pieces together. Anyhow, you can see this is the center point. That's the center asset. So you can imagine what's above it. And you can also see how the line continues at the bottom. Okay, it's terrible. Don't do this. Um, because I figured I can just reference everything, right? So I did that. Um, I just did that. So any form of referencing between blueprint and another blueprint will also load all the content with it and it will also load the other blueprint. Super, super important. So if you don't control this, it's going to get out of hand, especially towards the end of the project. And if you cost, it's going to get out of hand because the costs are also references. And we're going to get back to extensively to costing in a bit. So it ends up like that. This is size map, just to make sure again everyone's aware of what we're doing here. Right click, not reference viewer, but size map. Size map shows you what is loaded. So you see all the things that are referenced and loaded for that asset. So the functional door test example takes 660 uh, kilobyte total information, including the mesh, because the mesh, but that's the blueprint, sorry. The mesh is somewhere. The static mesh took 487 kilobyte, et cetera, et cetera, for the total sum of it. Right? So I did that on that above giant blueprint, and it kind of looked like that. I love how optimistic it is, or it tries to, tries to manage your, your feelings, because here in the top it says item standard, which is my blueprint, at least 1.1 gigabyte. I like that it says at least, it just gave up. Huh? Um, so again, kind of don't do that, maybe. Um, I've seen examples as well, for example, uh, we'll get back to this in a second. Actually, let me get back to this in a second as we go over that slide, because it's a very uh, applied example of that too. So you need to plan ahead in how you will organize and manage the references. Please think of this stuff. Prevent blueprints that reference a huge number of especially large assets. Try to split it up, have child blueprint classes under it, for example. So here, this is how I started my project. I said, in my project, I'm going to have a pipe you can pick up, I'm going to have a rock you can pick up, a plant, and I think it was a can. I've got four things. What could possibly go wrong, right? So let's make a single blueprint that we call item. And in that one item, let's make a function that sets a bunch of variables. So essentially, if this is set, what we do is we say, it's, it's this heavy, you know, it has this name, it has this uh, whatever. And then we reset a couple of things, and there was a couple of pivot, uh, um, 
God, I forgot the name. A couple of pivot point thingies. That's not the right term, but you get the idea. Reset a few things, and then I set the new static mesh. That's it. I did it for four things. So I did that arm four times. It's fine, right? Problem is, by the end of the project, I ended up not having four items. I ended up having 40 or so. So I ended up having this giant switch, and the whole thing got out of, out of balance. I ended up referencing every single one of those materials, textures, uh, every, all the particles, all the sounds that were unique for every item. Oh. Which looked like that as well, as you've seen. So here's what you should do, I think. This is the advice way forward. Uh, the best technique is to create a clear hierarchy with rules in place for where the asset references live, which should look like this. You have every key class is defined in C++, all of them, almost. There's always a blueprint that's then inheriting from the C++ class, and potentially another blueprint in turn where it makes sense. Content is ideally referenced primarily in the third step. So it looks like this, I have this overview. There's always a parent class, that's the C++ one. There is then the blueprint class, which in my item example would have been C++ interactive item, blueprint interactive item, and then the specific ones, item pipe, item bucket, flashlight, etc. That would have been the, what I should have done in retrospect. Um, because by doing so, and by making the C++ class above it, you always have that present. Even if there's nothing in there yet, at least you've got the, the architectures in place. It's going to make it easier later on to move things to C++ if needed. That's a topic we'll get back to later on. And by having the content references in here, in separate blue, uh, child blueprints, if a level needs a pipe, it will only load this blueprint. The functionality might still be here, but the, the content references, the materials, the meshes, they're only in this blueprint. They're only going to be loaded when the level needs that particular item. Right now, when I load a level in my game, it loads every single item you could possibly have and all the assets along with it. Uh, libraries, and this is, we're going to get to the example I just uh, wanted to say. Uh, if you have function libraries or macro libraries, any kind of blueprint library, we've got a similar kind of challenge there. If a single function of the library is used, the entire library is loaded. Please be aware of that. So if you have a reference in any one of the functions within the library, that reference is brought along. Um, I saw, I've seen an example uh, about a year or so ago where there was uh, you had a main menu, and then the main menu uh, was completely separate from the game, as it should be for these reasons. But it was one particular function that was used from a function, blueprint function library. So it just loaded something related to the menu. There was something in that function library, like, I don't know, you know find sound for, for menu or something, whatever. But somewhere else in that same function library, there was a reference to another class, which had a reference to another class, to another class, to the entire game. So eventually, it would load the whole thing. So the moment you would load that main menu, it would load one gigabyte of extra data for the act of doing that because of that one reference to the function library. So you really want to pay attention to that. For example, in this example, this is, uh, this is not optimal, but it could be. I mean, it, can, it depends, again, how critical it is. But to be entirely clean, it's not optimal. Very basic one where it says, here's a function, get components by class. I mean, get all static mesh components. Find all the sockets with this name in there. Kind of a weird one, I know. Ignore that. And then spawn emitters at that socket. I don't know why I want to do that. But ignore that. The point is, there is a reference here to an emitter. So that means that emitter will always be loaded whenever any function of, in that entire uh, function library is used. This would be more correct, where the particle is a variable that's brought in. Because then you specify what particle to use, where you use the function, and not in the function itself. So those kind of things. Game modes help with this as well. The whole point of game modes is to kind of help you separate the two, to kind of make a clear break. Okay, so this is all of that, and this is all of this. So we don't have the reference going back and forth. Uh, there's dynamic asset loading, which you can also do in Blueprints. Um, in fact, I can just show you in the editor. This is 11. Close all this stuff here first. Right, so we got this, for example. That would be the normal way of doing it. You just do set static mesh. That's now a hard reference. You could do an async load asset. Then you have the reference to the mesh there. You cast it to a static mesh in this case. And then you set the static mesh from that thing you got from the async load asset. That will load the asset on the fly as you need it. There might be a small hitch there. It's something to be aware of. And if you then look in the reference viewer, you see what happens there. You see, you get this pink line. That's a soft reference line. So it also distinguishes it in the reference viewer. Right, 
right. Um, sorry, this one as well. When you have soft references, and it's the only way forward when you have a lot of configurable parts or different parts, uh, you can use uh, maps. Again, that was the one we had underneath here. So we have a soft reference example. Go full screen here. You can essentially, you can have a string that's attached to the asset. So therefore, you can always find something. Essentially, it's like a table. You can say, find me the buckets. And you just say, look for buckets, and it finds you the mess, mesh associated with buckets, instead of having to look for the, the actual bucket itself. That makes it more configurable. It makes it easier to manage. If ever you change the, the bucket, um, the mesh itself, maybe assign a different asset to it, you wouldn't have to change some of the logic either, because it would have to try to find that asset in there. I mean, it doesn't even work. So this is the better way forward. You can look for a keyword, and it will return you the mesh associated with that. That's a map, map asset. Good. Um, also, just to point out, different topic kind of, but the loading times in the editor are way different from the final package project. Okay, so again, you can't look at that. And also in the editor, there's actually in the config file, I think it's the game, INI file, I think, I'm not 100 sure now. You can say recompile on load. You can actually turn that off. Because by default, when you start the editor, it's also going to compile the blueprints. In some cases, if there is a, this is rare, but I've had a case like that where something got corrupted in the blueprint, it will crash the editor the moment you load it because the crash happens on compile or blueprint, and the editor compiles the blueprints on load, so the editor doesn't start anymore. Okay? This would fix that. It might also speed up editor boot times, depending on project setup. Okay. Um, see on time. I'll do this one quickly, and then we'll we'll end part one, move to part two. Garbage collection is not very long. Uh, there's a lot to say about this. I'm keeping it fairly straightforward. Um, it's obviously the process of collecting and removing any objects that are no longer required. We got a test level of that because whenever you destroy something in game, it's not immediately removed yet. It's simply hidden from the world. It's simply marked as this should no longer be there, but it's not actually removed from the game just yet. Uh, because in order to do that, we would have to iterate through everything in the world and then say, yeah, that one should be gone. We can't do that all the time. That's expensive. So that's the garbage collection process. At regular intervals, the engine is going to look through everything and say, yeah, that, that, and then that. Let's remove that. That's garbage collection. Um, and it's somewhat expensive because of the iteration it has to do. Now, often there is no need to think about it, but I just want to explain a little bit again. If you're not from an engineering or programming background, you might not have considered this all too much. So what you can do here is there is a stat called uh, stat uh, garbage. Stat gc, sorry, I had the wrong one. It was stat gc, but I'm not running the game. In fact, I have a level here, 12 it is. Let's take that level. Okay, simple setup. It's, uh, these are going to spawn things, a lot of it. So worst case scenario, okay, a lot of it. Um, so you could you could use this to see what the impact is going to be on the uh, on garbage collections. Every now and then it's going to hitch because it's going to it has spawned a lot and it's remembering all of these cubes still and eventually it has to remove all of the cubes. You can change this and you can use the stats to see what the cost is, but you can change it just to test it in project settings and you probably shouldn't if you don't know really exactly why you want to do it, but just for the sake of demonstration in garbage collection, which I forgot where it's look, what it's named. Um, I can't remember what that was named. You can change the, the, the time, because by default it's every 61 seconds, I think. You can see over here, engine garbage collection, time between purging, pending, kill objects. Let's do that. In fact, let's look for purging, because nothing else is probably called purging. There we are, 61 seconds. If I make this, say, 10 seconds, and you run the game, you can clearly see what would happen, okay? So at, at some point in 10 seconds, we should get a hitch. But the computer might be too powerful, so Let's see. There, that was a hitch there. That was garbage collection. So you can tweak it. If you are doing non-games, there have been quite a few cases that we've noticed where it makes sense to tweak this value. If you are in games, I think it's, it's, you should be much more cautious. But for example, for some, you know, I don't know, if you work in film, for example, you don't necessarily want this to happen every one minute. You might be okay if just to let it run for an hour or so dependent on the memory and what you're doing. Good. And also, you can cluster. In Blueprint, there is a setting. In every Blueprint, there is a setting that says can be in cluster. Uh, but in general, the whole everything related to garbage collection is complicated, so 
if you are running into problems with this, if you're doing a lot of spawning and destroying, you should probably really involve a programmer and look through this properly. Um, and that's it. Let's take a break. Everyone good? Okay, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.